Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Tonight we're going to take a look at the test of faith. You know, this morning's message and tonight's message kind of goes together here in the aspect of John the Baptist being imprisoned and, and uh, his uh, disciples coming to Jesus, asking them if he's the one. Daniel is out of town, so to speak. Now, we don't know where he's at. According to tradition, according to many of the commentaries, Daniel's been called off, uh, called out somewhere into the kingdom for a special mission. And so he is not there in this time that we're going to see where the king is setting up his statue that he's made uh, for everyone to bow down and worship it. In Daniel chapter 3 deals with the matter of the testing of one's faith. In James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. There are reasons why we go through testing. There are reasons why we go through trials. I can't answer all the questions that people ask. Why am I going through this? Am I have done something wrong or whatever? I, you know, my answer for that is very simple. I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. You know, if, if the Lord would give you an understanding, all you got to do is ask him and he'll give you an understanding why you're going through this. Sometimes it's because we've, we've done something foolish. Sometimes it happens because we're being tested. I think of Job, for goodness sake. Job was a man who was a man who was no one like him in the whole world. No one like him whatsoever. In fact, when Satan had come to accuse some of the brethren, there in heaven, God told him, have you seen Job? There's no one like him in this world. And Satan says, yeah, you got a hedge around him. You take that hedge away from him and let me touch him. And I promise you, I'll get him to curse you in your face. We see that Job went through some horrible times, some terrible times, things that you and I would not want even our worst enemies to go through. But there was a great struggle between good and evil. Job was in that place. Job was in that time. Job was there to show the truth of God's mercy and grace. And here we're going to see these three Hebrew children, these three faithful friends of Daniel, their faith in God and its impact in their belief system is about to be severely tried. The testing of one's faith is not subject to a few individuals. Everyone, at least once in their lives, goes through a time of testing. Some go through multiple experiences in life. I don't always understand. I don't have the answers for that. That's way above my pay grade, to be honest with you. God has the answers, and that's who you need to go to when you ask, Lord, why am I going through this? But we're going to see today the truth of an old saying. It's been said, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you and I are in this battle in this world. You and I are in this battle. We are in the army of God, and the army of evil is opposing us. No matter if it's at work, no matter if it's at the stores we go to, no matter if where we're at, your, your faith is going to be tested. We're going to see, starting with Daniel 3 and verse 1, the image of, and its construction. As you remember last week, we talked about Nebuchadnezzar's dream and how God had given him a dream. And in that dream, he brought a great statue. It had several different metals each starting out with the most important going down to the less important. Each of them represented uh, different types of empires that were going to come on the scene in the history of America, uh, excuse me, in the history of the world. It's going to be, <clears throat> we were talking about America back in, 
<coughs> in our five o'clock hour, and I got a little bit confused there. But anyway, what we need to understand is these kingdoms we're talking about here in, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream showed where God said, I'm going to show you the different empires and eventually the very last empire that's going to come on the face of the earth to test the people. And the, the last, very last, what is called the stone kingdom is going to come and overcome them all. So God gave Nebuchadnezzar, who was a pagan king, the, the whole prophecy of what was going to happen uh, through the history of the world. But you see, the king is going to change that. The king thinks that he can change history. The king can, thinks that he can, can be the most important king of all, if not the only king of all. We see in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. Now I believe that we have the location of where it was set up, and where it was at, because I think it really shows us that Daniel wasn't really there. That if it would say it was just in the, 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 uh, the empire of Babylon, then Daniel would have been affected. But you see, Daniel was on a different thing. Daniel did not have to be tested like this. His testing will come later. But what we see here is the king's grave impertinence. The king made an idol of preeminence. The king made an image of gold. Now, if you remember our, our message last week, the first part of that, that image that Nebuchadnezzar saw was the head of the, of the idol, and it was made of gold. But the shoulders and the arms were made of silver, and the thigh was made of bronze, and the legs were made of iron, and the toes and the feet were made of iron and clay. But we see that the king is going to say, no, that's not the way it's going to turn out. Though God said this is the way it was going to be, I'm going to make sure Babylon is going to be the main kingdom, period. That's why it was made all of gold. Because if he really wanted to be true to his, his vision, if he truly wanted to be true, he would have made that image in different metals, but it was all in gold. Why? Because he's saying Nebuchadnezzar is first in this world. And he's going against God in this matter. So don't be surprised or don't even be shocked when the lost act like the world. Here's Nebuchadnezzar, a lost man. Yes, he, he basically had a time that, that he acknowledged God. But in reality, there are a lot of people who acknowledge God today that are not saved. Exodus 34, 17 says, You shall make no molded gods for yourselves. And so you see, Nebuchadnezzar not only took it a step further and made the image out of all gold, but he made it so that everyone would worship it. Now, folks, he's taking this on a little stronger than he should. And God's going to speak to his heart about all of this. But we see his disregard against God's word. Again, he just finished praising God in front of Daniel in his court. Look at verse 27 of of. Uh, of Dan, or excuse me, 47 in Daniel uh, chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar says, And the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of, a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Here he acknowledges God as the God of gods, but yet here we see Nebuchadnezzar now, just into the next chapter, making himself first and foremost preeminent not only in the lives of his subjects, but in the lives of those of the world. He just finished praising God. The king did not ask Daniel anything about God. He did not desire to know how not to offend him. You know, if you think if he was the God of gods <coughs> and that he was the Lord of lords, you would think it would probably be a very good idea if you kind of understood how not to offend him. But you see, Nebuchadnezzar's got a problem here. He's got an eye problem. And I'm not talking about vision. I got talking about, he's talking about him, I'm talking about himself. We see that he does not want others to be in charge. He doesn't want God's plan. He wants his. And you see, that's the way the devil is. The devil doesn't want God's plan. He wants his own plan. 
And so we see that, that Nebuchadnezzar, as a pagan king, is emulating the king of this world, Satan. And then he defied God's word. He misrepresented God's word. In 1 Peter 1.20, the Bible says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Daniel, Daniel here was, had spoke to, to Nebuchadnezzar and told him what the, what the image was all about. He interpreted the image for him. Now Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, God gave you the interpretation. Now I'm going to give you mine. It's all gold. It's all me. It's all Babylon. And so it, was a, it, wasn't, it, excuse me, it wasn't just about Nebuchadnezzar. This dream that God gave Nebuchadnezzar wasn't just about him, but it was about God's plan. God told us in chapter 2, it begins with Babylon and it ends with the stone kingdom and the coming of Christ. And so we see that all of history, from Nebuchadnezzar, from the Babylonian Empire, all the way to the, to the uh, uh, Antichrist is empire, and then eventually when Jesus comes back and establishes the kingdom. And so we see that it was about God's plan, not about Nebuchadnezzar. And then we see the king's grandiose immortalization. This this image was huge. It's colossal size. It was 60 cubits at its height and its width, six cubits. Of course, six is the number of man. And it was really showing that this was man-made religion. But in reality, that 60 cubits by six cubits equals 90 foot by nine feet. It was nine feet thick. It was 90 feet tall. That's a huge, monstrous thing. And again, what is Nebuchadnezzar saying? He's saying, I am in charge of this world. It's my kingdom It's most important. It's me that's going to rule over all these things from the beginning of the vision to the conclusion of the vision. We don't need this stone kingdom. I've got it all taken care of. And so we see its colossal size. We see its chief subject. It's an image of gold. The king, again, identified in chapter 2 as the head of the, of the image, and it was gold. And the king decided not to share his rule with anyone else, including God. It was a foolish move on his part. In Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 6, the Bible says, Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them. And do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. We're going to see Nebuchadnezzar is going to understand the hand of God. We're going to see a little further down the line how Nebuchadnezzar is reminded he is not in control. Now I want you to understand that today, even today, there are people today in positions who believe because they have a little power, a little authority, that they're over everything and all the lives of human beings everywhere. But in reality, God is still in control. Nebuchadnezzar will soon find that out. We see again this chief subject, and that was the image of gold. Now we see the king's intent and of purpose. Now he set it up in the plain of Dura. Now this was a pathetic reality. You see, the object of ceremonial worship was a pathetic reality because the people saw it as something to worship. I believe, doesn't say, but I believe it was in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. I believe Nebuchadnezzar was trying to make a move to say, okay, I'm going to be deified in all this. This gold represents me. I'm going to be the whole statue. And so we see its pathetic reality in, in uh, uh, rep, excuse me, Psalms. Turn a little bit to your left. Keep your finger here in Daniel. But in Psalm 135, Psalm 135, and starting with verse 15, Psalm 135 and verse 15, It says, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. 
They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, the eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. We see what God thinks of this idol that Nebuchadnezzar has established. I think it was God's plan to get Daniel out of here. I think it was God's plan that he set these three young men up to rely upon him, not upon their friend Daniel, who was a very powerful position at this time. And so we see he's going to give these three Hebrew children, these three Hebrew children, this test, and it's going to bring them to the brink of almost death. And we see the pathetic reality of the thing that they're going to, quote unquote, perhaps lose their life over is an inanimate object that means nothing. It means nothing. This is a picture of the last days of evil worship. Its prophetic reality is very important for us to understand. You see, in Revelation 13 and verse 15, it says, and it's talking about the Antichrist and the, and the false prophet. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And this is, this is Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't know anything about how to make a statue speak, but he knows how to speak to the people. And he said, if you don't bow, I'm going to have you put into a fiery furnace. The Antichrist and the false prophet <clears throat> is commanding the world to worship the Antichrist. Nebuchadnezzar was doing the same thing, taking the plan of God and making it all about himself. That's exactly what Satan does. That's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. That's exactly what the false prophet is going to do. They're going to take the plan of God and they're going to make it about themselves. And so we see an object of ceremonial worship. Next we see here in, in verse 1 an uh, objective of conformity. It's a people in unison. The Bible says they were there in the, in the plain of Dura. The plain of Dura. There they had gathered. They had all come together. You will come to the plain of Dura. And so he brings them all there. A people in unison. They're there as a people in unison. A people tied together by the bonds of unholy worship. A one empire faith centered in the personage of the king. They were together paying homage to the wrong God. Unison, but not unity. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. Now all the Hebrew children that had been taken into captivity there, especially these three Hebrew children, there had to be others there that day. There just more than likely were Hebrew children, other Hebrew people there in the crowd who bowed to this, this idol. But these three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew the word of God. Daniel knew the word of God. And they knew it was against God's law to have any other gods before them. Now, well, they could have done it, just like the early Christians that were told, you will take a piece of this, this incense, you'll throw it on this little altar here we have in the marketplace and you'll say Caesar is God and you'll be able to walk down the street no problems but there were Christians who refused to do that there were Christians who were willing to pay the price and many of them did John the Apostle was was sent to Patmos and, and sent there uh, for some time until the revelation came and he was brought back to Ephesus but we see here that there were some in that crowd that knew better, that knew it wasn't right, but yet they chose to do so. And that is, be careful today, folks. We have to be very careful that we do not do the same thing in a world that would have us to, to worship the gods of this world, that we would worship other gods rather than the God of, of the Bible. We see a people, a people in union and a, excuse me, a people in unison and a people in union. 
The lost world can be in union with one another, but it cannot be in unity with God. Unity equals oneness. The Hebrew word there is the word ichud, and it means a oneness. Though many times in our Bible, our English Bible, it is, it is uh, translated as one. But in reality, the word literally, literally means unity. And unity means a oneness. And union means togetherness. And three people that day were out of union with the people, but they were in unity with God. Now, my pastor used to use this illustration, and I love it. There's a difference between union and unity. You can tie two cat's tails together, throw them over a clothesline, and you got union, but you don't have unity. And therein lies the issue, folks. We can be in union today with our fellow citizens. But you see, we're not to be in union. We're to be in unity with God. We're to be in oneness with him. And so we must be careful, just like these three Hebrew children who paid the price, who took the stand, literally to not bow before this image. In verses 2 through 7, we see the image of its consecration. Look at verse 2, the Bible says, and, the, and King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providence. He even included the dog catcher. <laughs> You're all going to come here. We're going to have you right here right now to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. We see in verse 2 the command of the sovereign. Oh, you know, remember that old uh, uh, different commercial on television years ago when E.F. Hutton speaks? And everybody would go, oh, stop, and they'd listen, you know. When the king speaks, everybody stops. When the king says we're going to do this, everybody stops. We see the dedication of the command of the sovereign of the statue. In verse 2, he says, we're going, to, we're going to dedicate this wonderful, wonderful image, this image of me. I am the image of gold. I am the king of kings and lord of lords. And we see the deification of the sovereign. It's me. I'm the god of this world. A government-issued revival service. You know, government and religion does not go good together. And I want you to understand that according to what religion you're going to have, government's going to push it. But let me say this to you. Christianity has a government of its own, and it's a holy government. It's a government of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we can follow that government any day. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5 says, You shall not make for yourselves carved images. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. God says, if you're involved in idol worship, you hate me. If you're involved in idol worship, your families are going to be your family is going to be cursed, the third and fourth generations. And so we see the command of the sovereign, but he doesn't understand what he's getting ready to get into. In verse 3, we see the compliance of the subjects. So the satraps, so the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providence gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Everybody was there, all the, all the movie stars, all the, all the singers, all the musicians of the world of that time, and they were all there. They had their little VIP sections, and they were standing right there in front of that statue. We see their assemblance at the site. You see, Satan has us to assemble at the site of his choosing, not necessarily the church, 
Now listen, folks, the Bible says in the last days we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, as much more as you see that day approach, but encouraging one another as much more as you see that day approaching. And so what we see that in the last days, the devil's going to have a lot of quote-unquote Christians to assemble in different places on Sunday and not necessarily at the place of God. We see that they're at the site that the king had determined. And then verse 3, we see their allegiance to their sovereign. They gathered there because it was either turn or burn. <laughs> they didn't have much of a choice there, did they? We see their allegiance to their sovereign. We see their arrangement to the statue. They were there in front of it. The Bible says in verse 3, that they'd gathered there and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Oh, it was a new statue. A new leaf in Nebuchadnezzar's religion. A new leaf turned over in, a, in their livelihood and in their, in their culture. They were going to go there and establish a brand new faith, so to speak. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 21 says, Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they are useless. Oh, I tell you, we're going to see in a couple of weeks that that statue could not kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That Nebuchadnezzar could not kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That God preserves them because of their faith. And oh, beloved, even if they do kill us, even though like our brothers and sisters in Africa or Asia or North Korea or wherever they're at, they come and take their homes and destroy them and destroy their families and kill them, oh, even then it only hurts for a little while and we'll be with the Lord. And we see that these three Hebrew children tell the king, we don't care what you plan to do with us. We don't care if we burn, but if we do, we know we'll be with God. We see their heart is for God, not for government. In verses 4 through 6, we see the caution of the service. Then a herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. Verse 5, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. We see in verse 4 and 5 and verse 6 the caution of the service. We see the cry of the herald in verse 4 and 5. He tells them exactly what you are going to do by the decree of the king. You have no choice. In verse 6, we see the condemnation of the heretics. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Notice there was no free will choice. Satan never gives us a free will choice. There is no freedom in Satan's kingdom, by the way. Satan is always willing to tell you You'll do this for me. But Jesus gives us a free will choice. Jesus says, you come unto me all you heavy and laden and I'll give you rest. But he gives us a choice. So we see that again, according to the law of the king, it is either bend the knee or die. Joshua 24, 14 says, now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. We see that in this scripture that Joshua was talking to the people. You see, he was one of the oldest ones there. He had been in Egypt. He's speaking to a new crew here that's followed him into the land of Israel. And he's speaking to them and telling them this. Oh, he says, put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Some of the Jewish people had given their heart to those idols, given their heart to their gods of Egypt. You know, the Egyptians had household gods. 
And they would choose themselves whichever god they chose, whether it be the crocodile god or the baboon god or whether whatever they would choose, the jackal god. And they would choose that as their household god. And that's who they would pray to. When we were in the Chinese ministry, I, sometimes I'd go out with, with my uh, interpreter, Arthur. And we'd go out and make some visits. And Arthur would take me to these homes. And we'd go into homes and I would see on the wall this little, little shelf. And on that shelf would be little pieces of food and things of that nature. And have little statues on it. And so when we went out and got in the car, I said, All right, what is that? He said, that's the family idol. You see, they worshipped ancestor worship. And they would pray to their ancestors. And they would pray that they would give them help and take care of them. And they would sit that food up there for them to eat. But what we see here is these people in Egypt had been 400 years away from the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they had, some of them had fallen into worshipping the idols. You know, sometimes, folks, Christians fall into worshiping idols sometimes in this world. Oh, it may not be a, a literal figure or a literal statue, but it's other things that take the place of God in their lives. Sometimes Christians forget. Sometimes we follow things that, that are not meant to be followed by Christians. We do things or say things or wherever we go to do, what we do is we do things that, that are dishonored to God. And so we see in verse 6, there's a condemnation they're going to give to the Jewish people. Joshua says, oh, worship God, not the ones your fathers worshipped back in Egypt. And here these three Hebrew children had this background. They had this family, <clears throat> family background. They had this foundation given to them by their moms and dads. And, oh, beloved, if you do not give your family members the foundation of God, if you do not give them the foundation of the things of God, you do not, you do not give them an opportunity. Years ago, I, I was sharing with a guy what we did with my kids when we watched PBS, and they would come on and say, now 100 million years ago they did this. And I would say to my kids, yeah, like they were there. And my kids said that they remember when they were in class, when the, the teacher would say, now, 100 million years ago, in the back of their head, they would hear, oh, yeah, like they were there, you know. And there's the issue. The guy said to me, oh, you just brainwashed your kids. And I said, I, got, I brainwashed them before the world brainwashed them. And listen, do not be ashamed of teaching your children the things of God. Do not be ashamed of putting in the heart of your child the things of God. Because if we don't do it, they will fill it with the world. We see in verse 7 the subjection of the worshiping. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> the Bible says, So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and in sympathy with all, symphony with all kinds of music, all people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. We see the sounds of the pagan adoration, the song of adulation. They had a complete program, didn't they? They had the music, they had the musicians, they had everything. Oh, well, listen, we've got to be careful, folks. We've got to be careful because in this world, noise does not necessarily mean worship. We have to understand worship is the heart. And it's our heart turned toward God. And what we see is music can do that for us. We can worship in music. But noise does not necessarily make it true that it is a thing of God. And so we need to understand the song of adulation was a song of the world. And then we see the symphony of ad adoration. This music was given to these people so that they could worship this image. It was a piece of music. It was to give them the strength to fall down upon their knees and worship. Then we see their submission of admiration in verse 7. The Bible says, And they fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Oh, folks, it wasn't enough that they were there. It wasn't enough that they participated in the music. It wasn't enough 
but they had to fall down and they had to worship. We see the servitude of pagan allegiance, their worship of the likeness. The likeness of who? More than likely, I believe it was Nebuchadnezzar. And they worshiped him. And we see their worship of his lordship. Who is like him, they probably said. Who is like Nebuchadnezzar? He is king of kings and lord of lords. We see their subjection of their worshiping. And then in verses 8 through 12, we see in conclusion results of the state-sponsored revival service. In verse 8 through 11, we see the majority stooped. In verse 8, it says they rebuke, they rebuke their Jewish lawbreakers. You see, again, this opportunity was to get rid of the competition. This was an opportunity to get rid of the Jews. You know, for all the world's history, the pagans and the haters of God have always pointed to the Jewish people and said, let's get rid of them. But you see, God loves them. Years ago, the the chaplain of the military of the, of the king was asked, you tell me, prove to me that God exists with one word. And the chaplain said, that's easy, sir, Jews. You see, Jewish people have always been here. Of any people, they should be gone. Of any people, they should be destroyed. But God has kept them in the palms of his hands. God says they are the apple of my eye. And we see these pagan men turning on these three Hebrew boys. But you see, there was a reason, one religious reason. But in verse 49, the Bible says, And also Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Daniel brought his three friends up with him in positions of authority. And they said, this is how we're going to get rid of them. This is how we're going to overcome them. Oh, it wasn't a matter of religion. It was a matter of money and authority. In verse 9 and 10, we see their rule of judicial law. And they spoke to and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in sympathy with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. You, O oh king, are going to be having to do something here because you're, they're defying you. Now they brought the king in on this. In verse 11, we see the retribution of uh, Judaical legal action. In verse 11, the Bible says, Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Oh, the majority stooped, but the minority stood. In verse 12, the Bible says, And there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. This was the problem. We see how the world saw them. They were in their way. Their objectionable identification. These three you put high in your, in your government and look how they've treated you. Their outrageous insubordination. They've not fallen down. They've not obeyed you. They've not worshipped you. And we see their obvious impertinence in verse 12. Oh, they have not served your gods or worshipped the gold image which you've set up. You got to do something about this. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Their trust is going to be tested. Their love of God is going to be tested. We see that this is the first part of their test of faith. Oh, I love that old song. They would not bow, they would not bend, and they would not burn. And we're going to see today how God does support our faith. There are those in this, this place here tonight, I'm telling you, God is going to allow us to go through perhaps some type of test. But oh, we can know, we can trust God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Especially in a time like this, as 
Paul said was perilous times. Oh, Father God, as we come in this time and to hear of these three Hebrew children, help us to understand, Father, that you're the same God today. Help us to understand, Father God, that we are to love you and love you only. That we are not to fall and worship the gods of this world or the people who think they are the gods of this world. And, oh, Father God, give us strength, give us encouragement that we might live for you. And, oh, Father, if there be someone here tonight does not know Jesus as their Savior, we're watching on YouTube, this might be their opportunity. Help them to understand, Father, that we're all sinners by birth. We're all in that same boat, each and every one of us. But Father God, the, the boat is sinking. Death is coming. And there's a tragedy that we have to overcome. But there are a few of us in the boat that have a life preserver. And that life preserver was given to us. His name is Jesus. And he came into this world as the Son of God to die for each and every one of our sins. And he rose from the dead to give us life everlasting. And if we would just believe that, if we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if we would believe that we are sinners and he died for our sins and rose from the dead to give us life everlasting, Father God, we can be saved. For the Bible says, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And oh, Father God, if they would pray something like this and mean it in their hearts, they could become born-again Christians. Help them to pray something like this and mean it in their hearts. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I realize now that Jesus, the Son of God, came into this world to die for my sins, to pay that awful price of death. But he rose from the death, from the grave, to give us life everlasting. And if we would just believe in him, trust in him, oh, Father God, let Jesus come into my heart and save my soul. And to the best of my ability, Jesus, I'll live the rest of my life for you. I thank you, Jesus. As we continue in prayer, if you prayed that prayer tonight or while watching on YouTube, you make your decision public. Go before a family member or friend or even in a church service like here tonight and say, yes, I invited Jesus into my heart. Make that decision public. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Lord, help them to make it public. And Father God, be with us that our decisions we make tonight will be decisions that would bring honor and glory to you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christ.